Hello, everyone. Uh, we are here today with Kaizen, uh, who is the head of uh, design at Flash Coffee. And uh, uh, he's here to talk about um, hiring product designers. And we are super excited to have him. Uh, hello, Kaizen. How are you? Hi, Shoaib. Hi, I'm fine. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I'm excited to be here as well. First of all, really thank you for, for inviting me uh, to, to your channel. And I hope that whatever I share today will be uh, of benefit to your viewers and, of course, uh, to the design community in Bangladesh. Great. Uh, actually, we are really excited uh, after posting this that you are coming um, uh, today in my show. And uh, the people are really excited, including me, product managers, product designers, uh, even the developers. They want to hear experiences from you um, uh, uh, regarding lots of topics. And I gave you some question. We will talk about it. Uh, the first, can you um, uh, tell us about your career journey? How did you break into product design? And how did you come so far? Sure. Well, I mean, well, it was a long time ago. I started my design career back in 2005. So that was about 17 years back. So back in 2005, um, actually, uh, in, even in Singapore, right, I think uh, the term, there wasn't even such a term called UX. Uh, I think uh, back then the iPhone didn't exist. And of course, a lot of companies have their website. And it was also very popular for a lot of companies to engage uh, creative agencies to design flash websites for them. So now I joined one of the, I think, first two companies in Singapore that talks about user-centered design. Um, and, and basically one of the challenges initially back then when we would go for project pitches um, is that they, uh, we would regularly ask, uh, get asked this question by the business owners, right? Oh, you know what? Why should I hire you guys uh, to design this website for, for me? Uh, why can't I just hire, say, this creative agency uh, to create this nice flash website that has mm. uh, you know, animations and music and, and fantastic uh, uh, visuals. And, and a lot of the things I learned back then uh, would actually set the tone. I mean, it would lessons for me, life lifelong learning lessons for me. And that would basically help me uh, and cement me as, as a designer for what I'm today, right? So um, back then, uh, the, the way we would try to understand our clients is the first thing, right? What problem are you trying to solve? Okay. Why do you need this website? Hmm. What is this website for? Uh, are you trying to uh, sell more items? Or are you hmm. trying to reduce costs because you have a lot of customers calling you and you hope that by having a website uh, with all these answers, uh, all these questions answered, uh, hmm. will you know, reduce the call to call center? So most uh, basically, are you making money or are you reducing cost to the website? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, then in, in the next step, of course, naturally, is how are you measuring it? How do you know whether the website is effective for you? And it's right. really true this, uh, that of course, I mean, we speak business, right? And, and we, we get the business understanding that, hey, you know what? It's not really just about something that looks nice. It's something that works for me as a business that has that has value and can be measured. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's how we usually get projects. And of course, after we roll projects, we do the measurements for them. We want to show evidences of, of either improvement in business metrics like sales, or at mm -hmm. least reduction in, in, uh, in costs, like such as call to call center or support associated cost. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, in that lesson that I learned, uh, basically helped me to understand, you know what, uh, the importance of really uh, speaking the business language hmm. to subsequent uh, companies that I joined. So, uh, I mean, eventually I moved in-house from, from design consultancy. I moved in-house to telecommunications company, uh, then hmm. subsequently to bank, banking oh, industry. Yes. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, before, even before DBS, I was at OCBC Bank. Uh, in fact, oh, it was the first yeah. bank in Singapore mm -hmm. to have their own internal design team. Mm -hmm. Back then, most banks, they would usually outsource to agencies. But I think OCBC is the real, really first bank in Singapore to have their own experience design team. Um, I was there for a while, then before I, I went to Grab. And, and, uh, and, and of course, Grab, as, as we know, it used to be small back then. Now it's a massive yeah. company uh, with a lot of designers. And then, of course, uh, doing very well. And then eventually, of course, uh, left to DBS and then subsequently now at Flash Coffee. Oh, uh, that's really awesome. Uh, when you were talking about your um, uh, banking experience, uh, one of my friends from, uh, 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 from our community, uh, he also worked with you. Uh, actually, his name uh, uh, is Tuhin Bishash, and uh, uh, he work, uh, worked with you uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a company, maybe related to banking project. And he was saying it was really great experience working with you uh, because, uh, um, uh, you were, uh, because he learned many things from you. So that's really great. <laughs> okay, uh, nice. can you talk about... Uh, yes, please. 
<laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's nice. I mean, I, I, I'm glad that he has he has had a positive experience working with me. Uh, great. So, um, uh, did you? Uh, I mean, uh, what was your um, educational background like? I mean, uh, are you from business background or computer science background? I mean, uh, uh, can you please share? Oh, so so back then, uh, yeah, I was actually not. Really, I would say maybe computing science, but uh, I studied in this thing called diploma for multimedia software engineering. That was way back then. So, uh, so what we learned in the course is a bunch of things associated to, to uh, production of media, like uh, mm. coding, programming. So I have some programming uh, and coding background. I also mm. learned uh, things like uh, how to create 3D animations, how to mm -hmm. create edit videos, uh, how to do, of course, your, your graphic editing like Photoshop. Uh, and then, I mean, this was all very interesting. But I think for me, what connected and what tied all this together is this particular module that, that's about designing for human interaction. Mm -hmm. um, that, that made me realize that you know what I really enjoy this and this is something that I want as a career for myself oh that's great uh, you know that I previously started my journey as a uh, software engineer uh, after working for three or four months I realized okay no 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 maybe this is not the right career for me and mm -hmm. uh, um, I was I was really interested in UI UX design when um, on the psychology and the business and the technology it's a combination you know and then I felt I found my patient there and started working on that and Back in 2016 in Bangladesh, it was not like uh, um, so familiar term UI UX. And you can realize when you started in 2005, I mean, uh, you know, no one knows about it. <laughs> exactly. No one, no one heard about it. I mean, UX wasn't even a term. I think at that time, uh, we, we used terms like user-centered design, which is a lot more mouthful, a lot harder to, to remember. Um, <laughs> but I think at the essence right, of UX or, or user-centered design mm -hmm. is that we put uh, user success at the center uh, of, of our work. Really try to understand from the business, you know, what, why do you need this thing? What are you designing for? What problem mm -hmm. are you trying to solve? And, and, and how, uh, of course, from the user perspective, how is this like? And then we yeah. try to yeah. marry between yeah. business and design. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, one of the most popular question in Bangladesh right now. So when you are hiring a designer, product designer, what mm -hmm. is the first thing you uh, you look in a designer? What is the, what are the skills? Can you please? Mm. So uh, it really depends. I mean, it depends on the role I'm hiring for. It depends on the seniority mm -hmm. I'm hiring for. So uh, I mean, when, I, when it comes to design, right, I think of design as a huge umbrella term for a lot of different uh, skill sets and activities. So, I mean, uh, I tend to break it down into three levels. So, uh, at the first level, uh, there is what I call UX strategy. UX strategy is really, first of all, understanding uh, about what problem are you trying to solve? Uh, what information or how much understanding do you have of the problem? Uh, if you don't have sufficient understanding of the problem, where can you go uh, to find information, such as, for example, data? Uh, or what kind of research do you need to conduct in order to understand the problem better? And then once you understand the problem sufficiently, how do you share and socialize your understanding of, of the problems with the business so that everybody has a common understanding and alignment? And then from there, uh, solution together with the business, uh, what is the best solution that we can have uh, in view of constraints? Now, constraints can be things like timeline, very common constraint, can be things like cost, uh, can be things like, like uh, legacy issues. So all these are constraints. So basically, uh, you have a lot of constraints and you need the best solutions that fit in within the constraints. Then uh, that's UX strategy. The next part uh, is where the craft begins, right? That's interaction design. So interaction design is, uh, I think, typically uh, most people would say, you know what, like information architecture, uh, how the screen flows from one to the other, what is the user journey like, uh, what are the micro interactions, how do you lay out things on this page, what is the visual hierarchy, uh, and uh, what are the terms, even content strategy can also fall into interaction design. And of course, the final part, uh, eventually somewhere along the line uh, of, of your design process, you would move into high, fidel high fidelity design. And that's basically your visual design, motion design, uh, illustrations, all these things come into play. So, I mean, visual design to me is also a very important thing because that's what most people see at the end. Uh, with all things being equal, if you have two things of exactly similar features, people tend to prefer the one that looks better. Hmm. So, I mean, every single part of, of the design process is important. So now coming back to your question, right? So again, uh, when, I, when I hire or interview designers, I think basically it's really to understand uh, where does this designer fall in terms of the skill metrics? Where do they fall? Are they more a, a UX strategist, interaction designer, or are they more an interaction designer slash visual designer person? So, and of course, uh, 
space. Let's say if you're more of a visual designer, then naturally your portfolio is important uh, in terms of the visual quality, the finance that you have in your design execution, and, and the consideration for potentially how some of your work uh, might be interpreted by the engineers and how they can be implemented. Uh, Whereas if let's say you're more of a UX strategist and direction designer, then of course it's, it's really the process and how you deconstruct the problem. Usually problems can be brought, how you deconstruct the problems, how you how you get it down, uh, how you break it down into the simpler steps, how do you how do you uh, start your design process and how do you get to a common understanding and solutioning with the business partners. Uh, if I just um, uh, uh, just talk about one thing that uh, when you are just looking at someone's portfolio, right? So, uh, so what do you actually look for? A detailed case study or some screens, uh, a maximum uh, where there is visuals? What do you actually look for? Mm. How did they solve the problem? Uh, is it? Mm, yes. So, so uh, again, depending, like I mentioned, right, depending on the kind of role specifically mm. I'm hiring for. Now, let's say if I'm hiring for a, a more UX related role, UX. and mm. then I would of course uh, look at the case studies that they presented. Mm. Okay, how how they break down problems? What 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 were these? What problems were they trying to solve for? How did the project started? What was the role that they play? And how did they break down the problem? Uh, how did they solve the problem? Um, and yeah, and of course. Let's say if I'm looking for someone who is more visual, I mean, if I'm looking for a role that's more visual design execution centric, then obviously uh, mm. I'll be more keen in terms of uh, looking at their design output. And, then, yeah. and also looking at the other alternatives that they have considered and mm. eventually some some thinking in terms of why they went with one design over the other. Um, that's that's really good. Uh, great. Um, uh, if I just go back one step ahead, like mm -hmm. um, uh, many designers say that their um, uh, resumes are not, uh, no, don't get don't selected. Get selected. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. So uh, what do you think? What what? could be the main reason that um, uh, I have experiences or they have experiences, but uh, most of the time they are applying for hundreds uh, of uh, hundreds uh, in hundred jobs, but uh, they are just um, getting called from four, five or six. I mean, what do you think? Why they are getting visited from 95% of the jobs? What could be the reason? Mm. So, I mean, there could be a variety of reasons. I think, uh, first of all, uh, let's say now, let's talk for a typical, probably some of the more popular companies to work for that has more established design processes. And then uh, typically, let's say even for me, right, uh, I for a job, I can receive up to 50 or 60 resumes or, or, mm. or, or applicants for a particular role. And then, uh, and of course, I mean, looking through these roles and filtering out the right candidate uh, is mm. one part of my job as a total, right? So I have, I, it's really... Mm. Thing. In general, uh, of course, the, the first thing that, that you want to look at is, is which one are the ones that kind of catches your attention. So you do quick filtering, right? If uh, if you can design and structure your CV and mm. resume very well, um, mm. then obviously you, you stand a better chance. Uh, then, oh, of course, okay. you get, yeah, again, your, your relative experience, how long mm. you've been working in certain areas or in certain specific, uh, as a specific role. And then uh, that, that obviously gets you through. Then uh, ideally, ideally, you should have a portfolio or case study of sort, especially for a designer. Then I would be able to look through your portfolio or case study. Now, I have seen some uh, good ones as well. They, they kind of combine the three in one. So they actually sent a PDF file. It's almost like a, a PowerPoint presentation or a walkthrough uh, slide, right? In terms of, okay, so this is me. They introduce themselves. They talk about their experience in general. They talk about some of the background and some of their work. And then they basically just bring you through the story. It's the story that sells. So That's say versus, really yeah. So this is a candidate that has they probably say only uh, a word or, or, or PDF resume CV. Um, uh, it's obviously going to be less attractive. Um, so when uh, when Flash Coffee is hiring product designers, do you use applicant tracking system, or um, uh, you get the resume directly uh, and assess them? Um, uh, let me uh, let me clear it to you. Actually, um, um, uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a um, I mean uh, we have some assumption about application tracking system, applicant tracking system. So mm -hmm. when we submit our resume, applicant tracking system give it a score and automatically reject uh, from the job. So mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Uh, I mean, uh, is it necessary to make it more stand out? Mm. So we, we do use some kind of a application uh, tracking system, but I don't think our application tracking system relies on some kind of an automated process uh, whereby oh. they give a score. It's not really automated. So so usually we do have uh, talent hunters and talent partners 
uh, in, in the talent acquisition team in our HR. So uh, usually what they do is that they will, if I don't have the time myself to look through all those applicants, mm. they will take the first glance uh, and, and highlight certain specific ro- uh, CVs or applicants to me that, that stand out from the bunch. And of course, then then this is also comes into question, right? So will those talent hunters know exactly what they're looking for? Will those talent hunters know how to differentiate between, say, a, a good a good designer versus a maybe not not so good designer? Um, then then it's really a lot of constant conversations between me and the talent hunter to say, hey, you know what? Uh, the ones I'm looking at, and this is why I'm looking at, and this is the kind of thing that I would expect to see in that profile. So uh, talent hunters actually work for Flash Coffee or work for a, a specific company or they are independent sourcers. Can you please elaborate? They are part of the yeah. HR team, uh, exactly. our human resource. They are part of the HR team. So we have, say, talent acquisition. I mean, different, I think in large, larger tech companies, there is a variety of name for this particular role, right? For example, you know, mm-hmm. you have talent acquisition team is a pretty common term. So their role basically is to uh, potentially reach out to uh, potential hires on LinkedIn or through other websites. Mm-hmm. Or maybe mm-hmm. uh, they will also take the first glance at, at the applicants for the role and, and basically mm-hmm. filtering out the best profiles they think for you. Oh, uh, that's that's really great. And uh, what about, uh, I mean, uh, what's your thinking about the design task? Um, as we can see that uh, when we apply for a company, suppose even when I joined Toftal uh, as a product designer, they gave me a task and then took me about seven days to complete it and submit them. And uh, there was a designer who evaluated um, uh, and then gave me uh, uh, the approval so uh, what do you think uh, what's your process mm. so i think design exercise or design task is a to be honest pretty contentious topic uh, there are some people who are proponents of design exercises and there are some people who are extremely against design exercises and there, there, i mean there's equally good reasons to both sides uh, ultimately for a hiring team uh, when uh, what matters most is that I get the right designer for my team. And when I mention right designer, right, it is basically uh, understanding of your design skill sets because like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of design skill sets uh, in the whole design umbrella. And then uh, make sh- uh, understand your practice level, how good you are at certain skill sets, uh, understand your design process and approach, and understand your potentially your personality uh, and, and, and your profile as well, right? So, and how, how you would fit the, the, the characteristics and personality of the team. So, um, Usually, usually, uh, I mean, if through the interview process, the common t- uh, typical interview process, if I can get a good sense, I feel confident that I have a good understanding of the candidate. For example, mm. the candidate has talked very well about their work, has mm. presented his stuff well, and maybe when, when during the portfolio walkthrough and I ask certain questions, then they are able to answer the questions sufficiently. So that gives me high level of confidence that, you know what, I know this candidate well, then design exercise probably isn't necessary. But, oh. Yeah. Now, uh, having said that, I mean, there will be instances like, for example, you have potentially very junior designers or fresh grads, mm-hmm. for example. Mm-hmm. Or you have, there, there can also be true that, you know what, a lot of designers out there uh, are better at doing the work than presenting the work. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and it's true that the interview process tend to favor candidates who are able to talk and present better. I mean, talk, mm-hmm. I think your work is an important skill set as well. But again, it really depends. I mean, there are some designers who are, who are I've, I've met some designers who are absolutely brilliant, but just not able to sell their work, not able to talk about their work well. Uh, mm. Then in these instances, a design exercise would be an excellent uh, excellent way to, to more accurately gauge their skills. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, but I think the key thing about a design exercise is that it has to be respectful and mindful of the candidate's time. Uh, you should not make the candidates feel like they're doing free work. I have seen mm. design exercises that is ridiculous right they're expecting you to do a ton of work make a lot of assumptions and it's actually not very realistic whatever you get as output is it's really heavily dependent on how much time the, the candidate has to spend for the exercise and, and whether the candidate has the correct assumptions uh, so, so for me i think it's really uh, I, I mean personally for me what i have is that i actually have a, a bunch of design exercises uh, mm-hmm. well, that is meant to evaluate different specific skill sets Mm-hmm. So, so let's say if I'm not so sure about this particular skill set, I would communicate clearly to the designer to say, hey, you know what, I would like to understand uh, more about this particular skill set that you have. I have these exercises, maybe maybe would you be able to do it? How long? I would let the, 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 usually the candidate quote to me the time uh, that they are able to spend on it. Um, that's, it that's really great. Uh, okay, I'll just um, go into more details about uh, the portfolio. When... Um, uh, 
I uh, I actually heard from many experienced product designer that when they are working uh, in a rush company, I mean, they're, um, uh, they are working in product driven company in a senior role or even in a lead role, but they don't have um, um, that organized portfolio rather than when someone uh, maybe they have time, don't uh, have enough uh, um, uh, that much work, not that experience, but they have a certain uh, organized portfolio, very good visuals. How do you actually? Uh, how do you actually uh, measure this? To uh, experienced designer having uh, not having a good portfolio. On the other hand, not that experience, but uh, a good-looking portfolio. How did you just compare these two <laughs> initially? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, it's, it's interesting you brought this up because this is a, a a common problem. I think, in fact, if you, I think one of Jared Spoo. Um, if if you, I mean, if you're familiar with Jared Spoo, I think one of the the the, the things that he said is that, you know what, the best designers tend to be the ones without a portfolio because they're too busy solving problems and doing the work. Then actually investing time into, you know, crafting a nice portfolio. So, and so they're really so, bad at organizing portfolio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it, and it's true, right? So, so a, a lot of times, uh, I, I mean, even for myself, I, I spend so much time doing the work that I really don't think about creating my portfolio or working on my portfolio until, uh, you know what, maybe uh, a, a, a hunter, which is like me, you um, maybe I'm, I'm potentially interviewing for another role. Then I start about thinking about organizing, and doing this stuff. Right? <laughs> so uh, now, uh, one of the one of the my practice for for, for uh, that I've been introducing into the design team, right? Uh, specifically to also for my designers is that we need to start documenting design better. Okay. Uh, mm. Usually we have a, a regular uh, cadence, like every month we we talk about. You know what? These are the projects that we're working on. Uh, hmm. This is what we have done, and this is why we have been doing things in a certain way, or why the design has been done in a certain way. Now, this decks usually what I do is I will compile them. Of course, I will help to brush up the message messaging a little bit, and I would then share within the company uh, to communicate with the wider stakeholder, uh, wider audience, right? In terms uh, of uh, other business uh, stakeholders, like you know what, this is what the design team has been up to. Uh, this is what the design team has been doing, and these are our outputs. So I find this to be very, very crucial and important because it helps, of course, keep design, uh, helps to keep design in the limelight in a way, helps people to be aware of what we are doing, and, and helps them to understand, you know what, we have this design, and this is why we have arrived at this design. And it's not so much like, oh, you know what, I prefer this or prefer that, but there is actually a reason behind why we design things in a specific way. Now, uh, again, my advice to a lot of my, my team as well is that, you know what, uh, eventually, and you do this, it's also beneficial for you because when that time comes, when you want to apply for another role, well, you already have something like a portfolio that's already written out, maybe not organized in the way that you exactly like, but you have something there, it is already good to start with. So that helps you as a designer as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, now when an experienced designer um, asked me the same question about, uh, okay, so what about the India projects? When I'm working uh, for a product driven company, I'm not allowed to share uh, in details what I have done most of the time. Suppose uh, you can realize when you were working at Flash Coffee or you work for Grab. So mm -hmm. what do you think? How can I present my India projects? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I think what you're not allowed to share is the exact details like the data that is provided mm. to, to the company uh like maybe the designs that is not yet rolled out that is still in progress you're not able mm. to share that uh, but i think in general you should be able to share some broad high level uh stories mm. uh that mm. hey, you know what this is what we are working on this is the problem that we're trying to solve for and and, mm. and if the work is, is successful then we can say that you know what we have seen an uplift uh mm. and an outcome or we, we, we can also say that, you know what, we have some design and I would be able to share that design in person. Um, but you, I mean, it's generally not recommended to, of course, share as, as a uh, o, o, over email or over any other me means that, that can be easily traced back or mm -hmm. shareable. <laughs> That's really great. Uh, um, uh, there is another uh, another question that uh, I um, regularly hear from my community that, um, Suppose uh, when uh, we Bangladeshis, we are uh, actually living in Bangladesh and uh, applying in Singapore or applying in Germany. So uh, we don't get that much attention uh, compared to those who are living in Singapore and living in Germany. And uh, wh what do you think? What's your view uh, when you are hiring a designer from another country? What do you look for actually? Any special thing that you look for? Um, I think maybe at the broader level, uh, 
at a high level, maybe just to take one step back, in terms of really uh, looking at, at, at a candidate, I think uh, first and foremost, we want to get the best candidate that we think would thrive in the company. So uh, ideally, your nationality shouldn't matter. Uh, but sometimes your nationality do matter because, for example, uh, it, it will be things like, you know what, if we have to have meetings, or if we have certain policies where we require you to be in person, then you need to consider how easy it is for this person to be able to join the team. Uh, or maybe we have certain, uh, say, national policies in place that, that may make it a little bit more challenging uh, to hire designers from another country. So, so for example, uh, in Singapore, in order to bring a designer from overseas, you have to make sure that you have to get their EP, uh, employment permit and everything done and then this could let's say if i have a local candidate uh, that i see of, of potentially equal level and a lot easier to bring in and on board then obviously uh it's, it's easier for as a company overall just to bring the local designer so these are some really realistic considerations that we have on our side but now let's yeah. say if all those things are not the consideration then uh then obviously uh we, we look at again there's a, through the shortlisting process, we would highlight or we would shortlist the candidates that seems to be the most outstanding and the best fit for what we're trying to hire. Then, then we would give equal opportunity to everyone right, and, and just talk. Oh, just. That, that's really great. Um, uh, one of our community brother, his name is Asiful Hog Papu. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Asiful Papu, he recently joined Grab as a senior um, product designer. And uh, actually, he uh, shared his experience when once he moved to Singapore, then he started uh, tons of knocks from the recruiters. But till then, uh, it was not that easy. Uh, when he was in, uh, he was living in Bangladesh. It was really, really hard uh, um, uh, for, to get knocks from recruiters. But once he joined Lev, uh, it's a company in Singapore. Then he started <laughs> just knock. Uh, so the uh, scenario is uh, quite, uh, I mean, drastically different mm. when he was living in Bangladesh. So uh, 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 he shared that uh, the recruiters actually don't want to take the hassles when uh, they can hire the same experienced designer from the same country. Why should I go for uh, other country designers? So they don't want to take the hassle. Mm. I wouldn't say it's not wanting to take the hassle. I mean, there's also the perception uh, involved, right? So, for example, uh, right. if you want, I mean, if you want uh, perception. So, so for example, if I want to hire a designer, uh, naturally, mm. there are some countries. Uh, for example, if you talk about the states or the Western countries, uh, mm. or maybe the Nordic countries, or maybe even in, at least in this part of the world, Singapore, Indonesia, or Vietnam, uh, th these countries have a pretty robust uh, tech industry going on, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I mean, you have generally quite a number of companies with a lot of designers working for them. And, mm. and it's considering, I mean, relatively easier to hunt mm. for right. talent companies as opposed to say maybe other countries whereby maybe the tech industry isn't as developed. And therefore there is some question in terms of, okay, first of all, uh, would this, uh, would they have the relevant skill sets to apply? Would it be, uh, would, would, would their skill sets be applicable? How fast are they mm. able to adapt? Uh, to the local scene so so all this definitely comes into mind uh, especially for a recruiter right uh when, when they consider reaching out to candidates oh that's great uh what about the behavioral uh interview of a um, uh, of a product designer suppose um, uh, sometimes uh, we say that uh, i can see that many designers those who have great portfolio or great work but a uh, very low stress uh, year level i mean uh, low very uh, i mean they are not that good at collaboration that um, maybe they can talk uh, much or they sometimes they are rude uh, so uh, it sometimes it affects um, uh, um, uh, my co-worker or other team members uh, how did you handle this i mean how do you, how do you understand that okay uh, i actually uh, i need to understand the designer behavior mm. so uh, uh, that is part of the interview process yes how do i <laughs> pass out the individual how do you ask this <laughs> okay okay so i mean uh Okay, so usually one, one trick, no, not really trick, one, one thing of mine that, I mean, again, every, I mean, again, for one of my biggest design philosophies is that there's no such thing as a perfect design. There is only ah. trade-off, okay? So uh, you have a design, I mean, obviously there are some design that works better than the others, but then when mm -hmm. it comes down uh, to a lot of things, right, in, in the end, it's really about what design best fits the context and, and the problem that you're trying to solve for. And then mm -hmm. you as a designer have to make certain trade-offs and decisions, right, to say, hey, you know what? based on my context and based on the problem and based on the users, this is this is what we think would be uh, the, the best way to design. So, uh, and, and therefore, usually when doing interviews, I would, of course, find opportunities to 
probe a little bit in terms of their thinking, in terms of mm. their processes to understand, you know, how do you arrive at this? What was your thinking mm. process along the way? Uh, what were the major disagreements on the team? How do you, uh, how do you resolve the disagreements? And of course, uh, I would also try to criticize their design a little bit. I would try to mm. poke holes in their, their design output and I would Very want important. to mm. and observe their reaction to it. Mm. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I have worked in the past with designers who are who are very connected with the design because they invested so much energy, time into it. They, they therefore feel a sense of affinity and they feel emotional connection to the design. And, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, this means that they don't take criticisms very well. They, any, if you criticize the design, they take it very personally. And, and these are the designers that honestly are... A and that's the rare, rare signal. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's a bit like uh, because it's very difficult to work with. You can't criticize the design. If you as a designer, you cannot be criticized your work. You cannot take criticisms for your work and improve on it. Then it's going to be very hard. Hmm. To work with. So I mean, again, uh, I will look generally. I mean, I'll try to also observe how defensive they are of their work uh, versus how much they will defend their work. You can't be a push total pushover. Uh, hmm. that, you know what? Uh, any criticism you accept and you you make any changes as required. You need to be able to stand for your design. You should you should defend your design. Uh, you should, you should, uh, but at the same time, you should also know uh, when is it that you know what the criticism is valid, and and to take that criticism and use it to improve your design. Okay, so uh, you think that a designer should have logic when he is uh, doing his work, and he should not accept any criticism. I mean, once it's valid, he can present his work. Like, okay, uh, these are the logic behind my work, but he should be flexible as well. That if your logic is better than my logic, then I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, Yes, I mean essentially design is problem solving. We are trying to right. solve a problem, and and there's a lot of different ways to design. I mean obviously some some bad and some good, but mm -hmm. in the end, right? I mean uh, there are certain reasons behind why you have done things in a certain way beyond oh I like mm -hmm. it because it looks better, and and, mm -hmm. and and if you are not able to to uh break it down into into you know what these are the reasons why I think this design works better, then you become very susceptible to, to preference. Which, again, when it comes to preference, right, you will always lose as a designer because <laughs> uh, if you de depend on preference, then your product manager's preference will, will take precedence over yours or even the boss pre uh, preference will take precedence over yours. So therefore, you should have an understanding of you know what, this is what I've designed and this is why I've designed it this way. Now, of course, your understanding could only could be from a single perspective. And yeah, then it could be for you to mm. discuss. And if you have missed out on certain items, uh, mm. uh, uh, then, then obviously you need to, to show up your thinking. And then does that change the way you design? Mm. If so, then it changes. If not, then you need to also be able to defend to say, yes, I've taken your points. I understand what you're trying mm. to say. Uh, but in view of all these considerations, I still think this is the best design. Oh, great. Uh, Kaizen, what do you think the community, I mean, UX, how a UX community can help uh, to shape a UX designer? It could be, uh, suppose it could be a Bangladeshi community or it could be international community and how we can get connected uh, with the global community. Uh, can mm. you please elaborate? Mm. So I think having a design community is, in, is, is, is great, right? Because it allows you to, first of all, share your work. It also mm. allows uh, people to invite feedback for your work. Mm. And basically, uh, I think we, we all, all have different strengths and we all have different areas of weaknesses that we can all improve on. And I think having this community uh, and this culture of sharing uh, helps us to, to improve each other. Uh, in terms of, uh, let me, of course, we have a lot of local communities, but in terms of global community, I do know that, uh, that for example, there's this now, this, again, I'm not working for them, I'm not plugging for them, but there's this thing called the ADP list. Uh, whereby, yes. yeah, ADP ADP list. Right? yeah, exactly. So, so you can get connected to the wider global community mm. Uh, of designers of different seniority levels. In fact, I've also used ADP list uh, quite often myself to, to, to reach out to, to other more senior uh, designers from other companies as well, just to get their perspective and understanding of, of, the, uh, of how I should potentially deal with a, a situation at work or how I should tackle a particular project. Okay, the first question uh, is from uh, Delaware. Uh, uh, he is currently working at Shifal as a head of design. Uh, it's a US-based company. He's working remotely. And uh, uh, his question is, when you give design exercise to a candidate, what are the things you look for in their submission? Number one. And number two is, what's the best way of testing candidates' critical thinking? Mm. No, that's, I think that's a very good question. So again, um, you recall earlier in our conversation, right? I mentioned that that hmm. I have a 
bunch of design exercise ready. So all of them are meant for different profile of candidates uh, to evaluate different kind of skill sets. So I think that that is the first thing that you need to uh, understand that you know when you give a design exercise to a candidate, uh, what is it that you are looking for? Or what is it that you want to understand in a candidate? That the mm. candidate hasn't been able to sufficiently uh, share or you don't have a, a good confident grasp of uh, through the interview. So, so that is that what you should be looking for in your submissions. So for example, if mm. uh, I want to evaluate a uh, visual designer, that's just visual designers, then usually I would give a, a rough wireframe to say, hey, you know what? Um, mm. we are looking, this is the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, this is the rough wireframe that we have for you. Now, how would you keep produce the design? Uh, right. the design? How pretty is the design? How colorful it is? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The visual, so the visual is the more, most important thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the visual output, the quality, the execution, the finance, yeah, the, does he consider motion design? Does, does the designer come up with different alternatives and, and, and say, hey, you mm -hmm. know what? We still think this is the best. Does the designer take care of things like accessibility, uh, the color contrast? So uh, does, the, does the designer pay attention to a lot of the details. Like for example, I could show you, uh, uh, say for example, a cup of coffee, but I use very cold colors, which doesn't feel like, you know, uh, I mean, when you talk about coffee, maybe you should use a bit more warm color palette, for example, things like that. So these are the kind of details I pay attention to. Now, of course, uh, if I want to assess the UX, I think like uh, the, the next part of the question, right? The critical thinking skills, then my exercise will be a lot more broader, will be a, a, more, a lot more like, okay, uh, you're working for this company, and the PM has approached you with this problem, just, just a very big problem. Okay, for example, oh, we have a lot of users, but they churn. Oh, we, have, we don't have enough signups for, for this, this product or whatever. Oh, there's a lot of dropouts. We, we have a lot of users have added a product to cut, but they didn't check out. Uh, mm. then, then my question will be also very generic. Okay, uh, how, would, how are you going to work on this project? Mm -hmm. what, are your, just what are your proposed solutions? Then I would see how they, how they work about it. I think that demonstrates to you, first of all, the ability to, to think about a problem, the ability mm. to construct and break down a problem, and then uh, the ability to ask questions and propose uh, mm. different ways to, to come up and solve a problem. Because, I mean, uh, much as the schools or uh, much as a lot of design uh, education courses like to teach you the very typical double diamond design process, like, oh, you should do your mm. research, you should do this, you should mm. do that. I think we also need to recognize that, that uh, in most of the cases, you will not have a perfect uh, scenario whereby you're able to do a lot of all these things that you wanted to do so uh really it's about uh how how flexible and adaptable the designer is and how the designer can work within the constraints to, an, to a positive outcome as well so uh if i interrupt here for a, a little bit like uh do you want to see the constraints in the uh in the in his portfolio like uh maybe he did mistakes then uh he iterated it um uh, then uh he talk to the business and then iterate it. Do you want to see the iteration in the process? Personally, yes. I will be very Personally. important for me, right? When, when I look at portfolios, these are the things that tend to stand out to me. And the key reason is, is uh, again, I think there has been a lot of websites. There's been mm -hmm. a lot of places that teaches you or coaches you how to do a portfolio. And then mm -hmm. it has become, should I say, formulaic in a way. That, that if you look at a portfolio, generally, there would, they, they, they would be this way that they framed it, and it will be this way they present the design, and it mm. can get pretty, how should I say, boring after a while, because every yeah. single design, you read, it's the same style of presentation, it's the same way of talking about the problems. But then uh, comes one designer that says, hey, you know what, this is the way I do it, these are my very realistic constraints that I'm dealing with, mm. uh, these are my challenges, and these are where we disagree or where we agreed, and this is how we have moved forward with it, and this is what we have learned and how we iterated. I think all this... Mm tells me so much more right about the designer's adaptability the designer's communication skills or the mm. ability to work with people who are not designers for example mm. okay <laughs> okay let's take another question and uh, from muhay minul hussein uh, he is currently working an eye farmer as a head of product and uh, nice. the question is when designing a product uh, for uh, let me uh, tell you something about iFarmer. It's an agricultural based um, uh, mobile app and product, a mobile app in Bangladesh. So mm -hmm. the question is when designing a product for people uh, who are not tech savvy, what are the key things uh, a product designer should consider? Mm. No, that's to a help very users overcome the fear of tech. So mainly uh, uh, you understood the question, I guess. Uh, and this is the question. I think basically, um, how do you design for people who are not so tech savvy? Who are not so tech savvy, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that's a very good question, right? So uh, again, I think uh, 
in answering this question, I would want to recall back to the time when, back in 2007, I think, when the first iPhone was introduced. Hmm. And, uh, and then subsequently, of course, you have your iPhone, uh, your next generation iPhone, you have your iPad and all this stuff. And I think what was amazing back then to see, right, is that, uh, that you see a lot of different people, different generations. You see the very old people or you see the very small kids uh, walking up to an iPhone on display and then they start tapping it and swiping it and playing with it straight away without a lot of issues or without a lot of fear. Or, or I mean, this is so different in contrast to when, say, you're dealing with your traditional uh, phones like your Blackberries and your maybe the older Nokias, whereby uh, a lot of times, uh, even I have to constantly teach my parents, you know, this is, if you want to check messages, this is where you should press, this is what you should click. And then it's so natural for, for a lot of all these uh, even older people or young, uh, younger children to start approaching an iPhone without any prior knowledge, without any prior training and mm-hmm. start straight away. And, and again, I would like, uh, and I, if when I think of it, right, uh, essentially it's uh, bridging the gap between online, uh, between what's on digital and what's in the real world. And, and uh, in the past, when iPhone first came out, the, there was this, they, they rely on schematic design. I know schematic is an outdated term. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's outdated design. Uh, I know the world has moved on from schematic design. But then again, schematic design, I would say, is, is what actually ties that together in the first place, right? Because when you see a UI that is mm-hmm. like an actual representation of things in the real world, it becomes mm-hmm. a lot more approachable. Like if I see a knob on the UI and I know that, you know, on the knob in the real world is for me just to twist and turn, then mm-hmm. it's naturally for me to just try and, you know, turn the knob or turn on the switch or whatever on the UI. And there's so much approachable. So of course, uh, the world has since moved on from schematic design. Uh, Google mm. first introduced material design that was so flat, and and I think uh, it became a trend, right? Because uh, when flat design first came out, now in contrast mm. with schematic design, uh, flat mm. design is cleaner. It's very clean. It's very nice. Uh, mm. uh, it's also very focused on the content itself. And then mm. uh, everyone then rushed over. It became a trend, and everybody just rushed to change their design from schematic more towards mm. a very clean design. And, and mm. I think in the process, uh, there is something lost, right? And, and that is affordance. On a very clean design, uh, suddenly it becomes no longer as clear. Okay, what mm. where are the clickable areas? What are the tappable areas? In fact, I think uh, as your app or as even phones now, they get more complicated. You have a lot of actions mm. that may not be apparent to the, at first glance to the user. For example, uh, you have to swipe from bottom, swipe from top, swipe from left, swipe from right. All these swiping actions are actually invisible to the users. And until someone points out to them or until they try it themselves, they wouldn't know that it's there. Or even the hamburger menu, basically just three lines. What does that even mean? Uh, to, to someone who is not familiar with the tech, right? That, that, that tap on it means I expect to see a whole list of other options there. Uh, as Of course, compared to schematic design, whereby everything is just there as you see. So, so now I think it, the priority is to help uh, users understand uh I mean, they can uh, understand uh, easily yes, right? yeah, especially the non-text heavy ones now of course i wouldn't recommend all the way back to schematic design <laughs> that would probably uh, not be a very popular advice for for, for the current design. <laughs> but i would say that yeah, maybe make the affordances clear hmm right yeah, make the affordances clear. a lot of jacob newson's uh, heuristics uh, principles can actually be applied so if you follow a lot of those heuristics principles and, and if you if you make sure that that is very clear, uh, that users they know what the tap there's a mm. clear visibility of the system status. I think it makes it easier for people to start adopting mm. technology. Right. Uh, let me add something with you. Uh, when I was working for Truck Lug Bay, and we were uh, working with truck drivers, and we found the same thing that they are not the tech savvy. So uh, we actually uh, went to the. Uh, we did the user research we talked to them in even in truck truck stand uh, we try to understand i mean i'm saying they are not tech savvy oh, okay let's see uh, what about their mobile devices what devices they are currently using and what the what are the applications they are currently using we uh, understand, we saw, saw that they are using facebook sometimes and they are using even tiktok Vigo, <laughs> there's some application they are using, and uh, 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 even uh, even the, when they are installing the mobile app, they are doing using the um, uh, Gmail. So Gmail is already there. So our misconception actually, uh, 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 this was our misconception. They are uh, they are um, not tech savvy. No, no, they are not tech savvy, but they had very little understanding. There, there's some understanding, or then uh, we. 
um, created our application like that okay the minimal as possible like uh, even we uh, just remove the login process once you need to do anything you can uh, you need to log in even uh, we introduce something like just tap and go just uh, just accept it and go the minimum thing you need to focus on here it's not a social media you do your work and just take the trip and go so uh, that was the thing um, uh, that really helped us focus on the main key task he don't need to spend much time here so that's mm. great uh, yeah i mean yeah yeah exactly, exactly right so so again what is the main problem we're trying to solve? Be absolutely razor focus on that. And I think what you also mentioned, right, is also interesting, right? I mean, this uh the the, the I mean the, the the people that you did the research on who are supposedly uh are considered to be so-called non-tech savvy, uh, non are actually installing apps, are using social media apps, Facebook. And I think mm -hmm. uh that is also uh interesting because uh it really comes back down to what is the value of the app to the user? What is mm -hmm. the value of what you have to the user? Now if mm -hmm. if what you have as a, what, you, what the thing that you're trying to, 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 to let the user use is not of high value to them or not of high perceived value to them, then there is a lot more resistance to start learning. Yeah, exactly. Let me let me add some details here. Uh, we introduced digital payment for our truck drivers. You know, um, uh, we first we we are so feared that no 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 my, it might not work. But our CEO and uh, uh, he said no 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 let's introduce and test it. If it don't work, we will just uh, revert it back. No problem. We'll do it manually. But let's test it. When we uh, I mean uh, we introduced the digital payment, they learned it. And uh, there are some things that we uh, gave them some offers uh, like discounts when you just cash out and it really works. So uh, sometimes uh, uh, sometimes I think uh, uh, we can think something alternative. How can we uh, make it work? Yes. Yes. How do you increase the perceived value that your users can get out of the system? Um, if, if you are showing, if you're, all you're offering me is just a digital payment and, yeah. and comparing to say the existing model whereby I just pay you uh, it's the same amount and you know i know you so well i see you all the time i just hand over the cash to you versus mm -hmm. you ask me to go online and i need mm -hmm. to start my credit card details i need to remember all the, the the numbers and all the stuff and it's a long step in the process it's a laborious process then obviously for me uh, i'll be more inclined mm -hmm. to stick with my existing way of doing things mm -hmm. yeah so really how do you easy for users how do you make it how do you how do they how do you help them see the value of what you're trying to do it's also <laughs> important Great. Uh, let's take another question from my uh, own company CTO. Uh, his name is uh, Minhaju Rahman. Uh, he's currently working uh, as a CTO of Drak Lag Bay. Uh, the question is, uh, what kind of behavioral differences you see in Eastern and Western user audience? Uh, is there is difference? How to address this when you are uh, working in a product? This is a, okay, so personally for me, I, I would say that it's a little bit harder for me to answer this question. I, I can take a step at it uh, because, I mean, majority of my career I've been designing in, in, in Singapore and, and, and users tend to be, how should I say, more uh, aligned with how the West would design versus how the East would design. Mm. Of course, I, I have also studied mm. a lot of the other uh, different kind of interfaces as well. For example, for China, uh, mm -hmm. If you look at it right, uh, China, the Chinese UI tends to be a bit more cluttered, uh, because yes. <laughs> yeah, because, their behavior is uh, yes, um, yeah, they, they're very. I mean, their their behavior is different. I think they are more tolerant of clutter. They are more tolerant mm -hmm. of different things, and, and for them, uh, there is some value because uh, I see, you know, if I see a lot of so called banners, um, then then it means that you know there's a lot more things for me to discover. They perceive mm -hmm. it. Uh, then, then uh, maybe say the Western audience will buy. You know what? Don't show me so much balance. I just want to get my task done as soon as I can. Um, and the other thing, of course, is also the language itself is also an issue, right? So, for for, for example, for Mandarin, uh, a lot of, you can use usually say one or two characters to explain a lot of things. Oh, yeah. Uh, whereas, yeah, so so you could fit a, a potentially a very long sentence into a few words. Hmm. Uh, whereas for English or Roman characters, uh. You you can't really do that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, so I think I think maybe uh, in terms of the relevance to design, uh, my experience in the past is that that this mm. also is interesting, right? How do you design? Uh, you went, how do you design for the different regions? Uh, how do you def design for, for example, certain languages? Uh, for example, Thai or Burmese, they, are, they tend to be a bit longer in their characters. 
So how do you design for that? Your design should be scalable and should, should take all those different situations into consideration as well. Uh, great. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, that's, the, that's three questions that we took from the uh, Bangladeshi UX community. Thank you so, uh, so much for asking this valuable question. And uh, let me uh, get back to uh, uh, the design process. I mean, what process do you follow when working in a team at... Uh, 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 flash coffee how do you work with the designers product managers and developers can you mm. please mm. so so I, I mean the design approach that i use is probably one of the most common approaches which is uh, known as the double diamond or uh, uh, the divergent convergent thinking uh, is a very common design thinking process whereby uh, the first part of the diamond you probably have seen this diagram somewhere before is is a really uh, understanding uh, is really about doing the right thing understanding mm. what Problem you're trying to solve, uh, mm. and then the second part of the diamond is really about doing things right, which is uh, which goes down your design to your design execution mm. and the way you mm. design, the way you show it to your users. So, so uh, this is the standard design process. So, let's say if uh, we have a new project request comes in mm. coming in from, from the business, then uh, usually what I would try to do or what my designers would do is to first of all understand what is the problem you're trying to solve. Right, right. So that's the again that's the core question. Why why do we, what well, what is this project about? What problem are you mm. trying to solve? Why did this project come about in the first place? Uh, how much understanding do we have on this on this on this thing that we're trying to do? Are we trying to copy our competitors? Uh, because mm. competitors have it, therefore we must absolutely have it. Uh, or is it is it that we have some research or we have some data showing that you know what mm. this is a problem for us and we definitely need to do this thing? I'm so when you were when you are getting requests from the business team that uh, that we need to do, now you assess it. Do you have any uh, counter or any defenses, um, uh, any logic that okay? Sometimes no, 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 no. We don't need to do that, or we can do alternate uh, alternate things. And do you propose it usually, or your team member? Mm, so so okay. So again, I think this comes down to design maturity of a company. Now let's okay. say if if um. I have definitely worked in design environments whereby uh, the, the, hmm. the, the whole process is less mature and, and it's, the, the business are insistent on doing things in a certain way. Then for hmm. me, right, then for, uh, it will be again coming back to this thing is, you know, how are we measuring success? Hmm. We are investing, I mean, time, energy, effort in, in doing this, this project. Uh, you are taking time of, of designers who are mm -hmm. at a certain level and then you have engineers who need to spend a lot of time uh, hmm. doing this project. And of course, you have also other projects which needs to be done. So that means there's some opportunity cost as well that if we do something wrong. Uh, so so how, how do you ensure they're doing the right thing? How are we measuring success? And then usually this would help them to think a little bit better in terms of, okay, there must be an outcome that you're designing for. There must be some kind of measurement of success. We are doing this because we think that, oh, you know what? If I do this thing, customers will like us better and therefore they will use us. How do you know that? How are you going to measure that? So, so again, this goes. This will eventually redirect back, them back to the the first question, right? What problem are you trying to solve? Okay, uh, that, that's great. But uh, uh, if I say, what do you measure the success of a design? Suppose you are, uh, you have just uh, finished a design and just uh, it's gone live and it looks good. Okay, but how do you measure the success of the product that you just built? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, success of the product again, it depends on. Okay, uh, I keep talking about the problem that you're trying to solve because that tells you, I mean, what the success is, right? For example, if, if mm -hmm. oh, the, 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 for example, you can say that, hey, uh, there's a lot of people who drop off at the checkout page. Mm -hmm. They simply don't check out. Uh, they add a card, but they just leave the card as it is, right? They don't check out. Then, of course, for the designer, it's really to understand why this is happening. Uh, mm -hmm. deep dive. Uh, you can start from, say, if you can't do very in-depth research, you can already start doing heuristic evaluation and look at the design and understand why. Is it because the button isn't clear? Is it because the, the terms or the, the words that you use isn't clear to users? Um, and, and, and then from there, how would you make the changes? And then after you make the changes, uh, do you, in terms of the numbers, do you see an increase in the number of checkout, for example? Right, right, right. So yeah. you first determined, okay, these uh, these are the current condition and that we are working on. And after, when it goes live, then we will see the data that, okay, uh, now uh, the product is performing better. Um, uh, 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 it could be a particular feature. So uh, um, uh, getting more clicks or uh, getting more outputs from that, we uh, uh, more uh, generating more revenue. So this is how you actually measure. 
Okay, Correct. that's that's really nice. So, uh, have you ever um, uh, struggled to work with uh, product uh, uh, product uh, uh, managers, or have you struggled with uh, uh, the engineers? Suppose uh, sometimes we see um, sometimes many product designer complains that uh, we don't get actually um, the fix requirement. It's keep changing, changing, and changing. So uh, even sometimes when I uh, when uh, when we um, uh, when we designers actually um, uh, uh, deliver uh, deliver a design, uh, sometimes it not as it is that how we design. Um, uh, it's okay. What? How do you think? I mean, what's your experience on that? On that? Mm, I think um, is I mean that is a pretty common thing, right? So uh, usually right. when we design, we would design what we think is the best possible experience. Uh, mm -hmm. I think based on the research that you have done to know that this is the right way to do things. But of course, when it comes to implementation-wise, um, there could be engineering challenges. There could be legacy issues that they have to deal with. And of course, uh, you and of course, from, from the product manager side uh, and the business side, they definitely want to see this thing go live as soon as they can. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then, then this, of course, uh, for me, comes down to having that, that discussion, right? I think uh, Airbnb calls it 3D goods too. Some other places call it 3 in the box. It's really mm -hmm. to a, basically have, have your product managers, your mm -hmm. engineer and your designer really come together and, and agree, you know what, uh, in terms of the success metric, right? What is, what, how do we measure success? What is most important for the users? Or what are the things that, you know what, could do, or maybe not, not important for now? Uh, what are the things that can be done in later phases? And therefore, agree on what the, the minimal lovable product is. So mm -hmm. again, take a lot of uh, it will, I'm very deliberate in, in saying minimal lovable product uh, I think that's for, from Amazon as well now uh, mm -hmm. some other places they call it minimal viable product uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't quite like the word viable so much because uh, what's viable to, to you could be different to someone else the word viable is mm -hmm. open to interpretation for example mm -hmm. uh, potentially say to a, in a low design mature environment say maybe what's viable to the engineering is that I can launch this thing and everything compiles and there's no bugs that's viable it works, it's viable. Uh, whereas what's viable to say a designer is that, you know what, this thing must have particular features, must see certain amount of success and traction with users, for example. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, and if you cannot resolve these differences, then it becomes difficult to move forward. Whereas minimal level product is something that's less ambiguous. You must have a product out there that at least at minimum, it's small, but your customers will love it and they would want mm -hmm. to use it. Yeah. Um, so it means that we should not be too strict on something like, uh, and suppose uh, well, sometimes we see as the designers when we are working, um, uh, we hear a lot of complaints about the developers, but I think uh, uh, we can be more flexible about uh, it. And what do you think uh, um, uh, about the communication? I mean, designer and developer, uh, designer and developer communication, uh, when should we reach uh, my developers? Should it be a flat environment or should it be like uh, I should reach out uh, reach out someone via email what is your process now in the past uh, pre covid right uh, when it's possible to be in office uh, usually i, I like um, to either either uh, myself or have my designer sit next to the engineer mm -hmm. i think that that helps to make a lot of communications easier that helps it to, to uh, each other to understand what each other's constraints are and, and what each other are looking at so so usually you have a very fast outcome uh, I've also personally, at, at least in the earlier days at Grab, uh, where, where we were smaller and a lot more scrappier, uh, I have very good experiences of working directly with engineers. Whereby I don't even have to give the design file. I just have, to, I just draw very roughly on the sketch paper to say, hey, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to position this thing. And I see oh, the engineer yeah. take this the code and then on the spot reflect the changes. And does this work? Yeah. No. Why not? Things like that. And we discuss how to reiterate oh, on the spot. Yeah. And then that was fun. So, um, as you're uh, talking about the, it's uh, it's like a next door neighbors. So I'm working on that. Can you please check it out? Okay, okay. Let's see if, if everything goes fine. Then I continues. So if he says, oh, no, 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 you can just uh, um, uh, it will uh, it will be technically uh, not feasible. Then uh, mm -hmm. uh, you are rethinking your um, uh, design. So like that. Mm -hmm. Mm, yes. Okay. I mean, let's say now. I mean, that's a lot more. I mean, it, that that could be possible in a scrappier environment. But now, let's say, uh, if we go to the more modern approach or in larger organizations, mm. whereby more formal processes in place, then uh, again, I will go back to the tree in the box uh, situation. Mm. Whereby, uh, first of all, when we discuss the solution, uh, ideally the engineers should be involved in the mm. solution as well. 
and then uh, you can already have some rough sketches, right? To talk about, you know what, this seems like roughly how the flow could be structured. This seems mm -hmm. like what well, some of the content that we need to display. And in order to display this content, we need to pull data from these different databases. Or then the engineers could already start preparing their mind, right? Okay, what APIs do I need? Or how do I need mm -hmm. to make this and then, then yeah. the discussion can then happen to say, oh, you know what, this solution may not be possible, or this mm. solution is possible, but it will take too long. Uh, do you have something else? Then this also saves designer headache of, you know, oh, right. uh, yeah, sure. investing a lot of time in designing something that cannot be realistically achieved fast. Mm. Then it's a lose-lose situation for both. I mean, if you uh, if they can cannot design what I have designed, what they can develop. So uh, we should align them from the beginning, at least you know, on a minimal level. Right. Yes. So yes. that's that's really great. Uh, thank you so much, Kaizen. Uh, it's almost a one hour, and uh, when I, uh, I mean, uh, thank you, thank you so much for uh, uh, g giving your time for the Bangladesh UX community. I think uh, they will love you so much, and I I'm sure you have already uh, uh, already um, uh, got requests from lots of Bangladeshi uh, UX product designers in LinkedIn. Or so connection request also. Uh, so do you have any suggestion uh, for our community, those who are currently working as a product designer or want to be a product designer? Any suggestions? I would say, uh, again, to, uh, read widely. Read more books. I, in fact, uh, throughout my entire career, I have I have uh, gotten a lot of reading. And of course, connecting with the community. There's the fantastic uh, yeah. community, yeah. the AEP list that you can reach out to, uh, different designers of different levels different expertise that you can reach out to just to, to learn and understand things better. Uh, and I would say that the, the, the most important thing is always be learning. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, uh, for watching this episode. And uh, if you like this type of conversation, do subscribe. Yes. And uh, I will try to bring more people from international community to talk about UX design, product design. I hope uh, our community will do great in future. And we will design more user-centered product. So uh, that's all uh, for today. Thank you so much, everyone. Kaizen, thank you so much for joining and uh, all the best wishes for you and for your team. Thank you. Thank you, Shoy. Thank you. Uh, again, once again, thank you for having me. Thank you for, for taking the time to talk to me and, and I wish all the best to everyone.